Well, uh, I have the privilege of standing, as Spurgeon said, behind the holy desk this morning to share God's word with you. And so I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book or gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. So if you would please open your Bibles. And if you don't have your Bible, can I give you an encouragement? Bring your Bible to church, right? We pray the word, we sing the word, we read the word. Bring your Bibles to church, have them with you. But if you don't have one this morning, you can follow along on the screen, and hopefully that'll be a, a blessing to you as well. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 begins like this. It says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray and ask God's blessing together. Lord, we're so grateful to have your word this morning. We are gathered here as your church as your body, as the people whom you have redeemed out of this world into your kingdom. Or Lord, perhaps there's some here who are not in that kingdom as of yet. Lord, we'd ask a blessing on the reading and the studying of your word this morning, that it would accomplish all that you desire it to. As we see in the, in the gospels and in the book of Acts and throughout the letters, as the word is read, there are spiritual things that take place in the hearts and the minds of the hearers. And as we are here underneath your authority and under your word, we'd ask for the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Gospel of Mark. In verse 1, just by way of introduction, and you can follow along in the bulletin with the little insert there. There's an outline. If you want to take notes, you can do that. In verse 1, it just starts right off the bat. The book of Mark sta states that this is the beginning or the commencement of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And before we jump into the text, I wanted to give a little bit of a background. Um, we normally do this, give a little bit of context, but especially since this is the beginning of a book or the gospel of Mark, I thought it would be beneficial to us to give a little bit of background and setting for the whole book. The author, most believe, and we understand the author to be Mark, of course, it's the Gospel of Mark, but he's also known in the New Testament as John Mark. If you look in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, it says, so when Peter had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. You'll see the connection in a minute between Mark or John Mark and Peter. But we know that he would have been very young at the time of the crucifixion, death and resurrection and the ministry of Jesus. So it's believed that the bulk of his information was received from 
Peter, if you look in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, and it'll be up on the screen there, it says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. So we see the connection there between Mark and Peter. It's believed, although Mark was very young at the time of Jesus' ministry, over time, eventually he received the account from Peter and recorded it for us to read and, of course, the original readers to read as well. Most put the writing of Mark around 50 to 60 A.D. or after uh, 20 to 30 years after the death and resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. The audience, this is who is reading this gospel, originally would have been believing and unbelieving Roman citizens. Peter, of course, was crucified upside down in Rome, spent the last part of his life in Rome. Mark naturally would have been with him, and it's believed that uh, Mark wrote this gospel primarily to Roman citizens. Now Mark, going back to verse 1, you can look there in your Bible, he identifies his writing as the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I've probably already done it this morning, and most often we say that this book is the gospel according to Mark, right? Well, more accurately, it would be to say that it's a gospel account of Mark. Mark testifying, declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mark records this gospel, and the word gospel means good news or good message. You're going to hear that term repeated over and over again this morning. It's a declaration of good news. It's a good message. And he gives it to present an account of the life, the works, the teachings, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's his purpose. He wants to tell the readers about Jesus. Now, as we said, the audience, potentially some believing Roman citizens, this would have been given them a better understanding or a better foundation for their faith, right? Understanding who Jesus is, what he did while he was on earth, what he taught, and of course, of course his death and resurrection. Now, it's also worth noting that between 50 and 60 A.D., this is the time when Caesar Nero was ruling in Rome. And so this could have been a great encouragement to the believers under Nero and his persecution of Christians. But for those who didn't believe, most commentators will tell us that Mark had an evangelistic, a missionary mindset in writing this gospel. He wanted to share the good news, the good message of Jesus Christ with unbelievers. And because the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news, you could say that that implies that there's bad news, right? Let's look at Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6 to, to give us an understanding of this. Romans chapter 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is a letter that was already written to the church in Rome, and, and perhaps this message was permeating Rome at the time. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The bad news is, is that man is lost and in a fallen state of sin apart from Christ. They're in rebellion towards God and therefore subject to death and deserving of eternal punishment. But Mark states here that the coming of Jesus is what? Good news. It's a gospel. And that was his desire, was to share this message. So to conclude our introduction, we'll look at verse 1. Again, it says, Mark says that this good news is centered on a particular person, isn't it? It says it's the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Mark here identifies Jesus with two very distinct terms. First, he titles Jesus as Christ. Now, I don't say this to be facetious, but Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? We're so used to first name, last name, right? It's actually a title. It's a designation. The word Christ means Messiah or anointed one of God. Secondly, Mark declares from the beginning that Jesus is the Son of God. 
And both of those things to say that Mark doesn't just present Jesus as merely a good man or some elevated prophet, but very specifically, he identifies Jesus as the anointed Savior and as God's divine Son. And these two truths set the scene not only for our text today, I know this is a little bit long of an introduction, but it sets the scene for the whole book. So if you happen to be inspired today and want to go home and read the whole gospel of Mark, you will see this theme throughout the book. But here in our text today, Mark sets in motion a declaration or a holistic account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will see in our text, the way I've broken it up, and you can see it on your outline there, is three voices, three voices that help us to understand our main point this morning. And you can see our main point on the screen. Here it is. The good news is that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God, and he offers entrance into his kingdom by faith and repentance. The good news is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he offers entrance into his kingdom by repentance and faith. We'll see the first two voices testify of who Jesus is, the Son of God, the Christ, the one sent, and the last voice is Jesus himself calling people to repentance and faith. Now, another aspect that we'll see this morning in our text, what I'm calling facets of the gospel. You see, the gospel is not just merely a statement. It's, you, you, it's, I mean, you can't condense it down to just a few simple words. There is so much in the gospel. And I chose that word facet because that's a term used when describing a gem or a diamond. Maybe you're familiar with this. A facet is just one part of that gem or diamond that you would zoom in on and look and and appreciate, right? It's defined as one side of something, many-sided, especially of a cut gem. And you could say that the gospel is like that, like a rare and precious stone. There are so many sides to it that make it beautiful and invaluable. And so as we go through this, I hope to point out just a few, we're not going to be able to cover them all this morning, but just a few facets of this good news, this gospel about Jesus Christ. So first, let's go to verse 2 and we'll see the voice in the wilderness in verses 2 through 8. The voice in the wilderness and what does it say about Jesus and the gospel? Verse 2 says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. There comes this, we see these uh, two verses. We see first about this voice in the wilderness. We see that it was prophesied. It was determined beforehand. It was declared beforehand that it would happen. Right from the beginning, Mark lets the readers know that the events surrounding this voice in the wilderness are a prophetic fulfillment. They're a prophetic fulfillment. The coming of this messenger is, you see that small but very important word, is as It's according to, it's agreeable to the fact as it was written or described in Scripture. Here Mark cites Isaiah the prophet as the one he credits for these prophecies, but he actually quotes both Isaiah and Malachi to show that the coming of the messenger, we'll see later as John the Baptist, was determined and decreed by God. The prophets wrote of the coming of two people in these texts, the messenger, John the Baptist, and the Lord, or the Lord Jesus. Just as God inspired the prophets to declare it, so it was fulfilled in the coming of both John and Jesus. And here's one of our first gospel facets. One of the amazing and miraculous aspects of the gospel is that it is a prophetic fulfillment. It's a prophetic fulfillment. All that we see here in our text, all we see in the Gospels, all that we see in the New Testament writings, the times in which we live, the Gospel times, the future coming and reign of Jesus have all been predetermined by God. God declared it long before it ever happened. 
And you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, I believe it's verse 15, where God promises a deliverer to defeat Satan and the effects of sin. And then from there you can read in the scriptures of how God weaves he weaves his salvation plan through the course of history, through human history. Only God could accomplish such a redemption story. Amen? And this is good news. Would you agree? This is good news. Well, we not only see that the voice was prophesied, but we see that the voice had a purpose. Look in verse 2. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one, verse 3, crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Twice we're told that John the Baptist, this messenger, had a task to prepare, to make ready, to equip with all things necessary, right? He was to make ready a way or a road or a journey. In verse 2, we see that this preparation was for a person, right? We see, the, we see the pronouns there. Your, we see it's in preparation for someone. I, your, prepare your way. And then in verse 3, we're see, we see that the way is being prepared for the Lord. Lord here means master or sovereign or supreme in authority, he was to prepare a way. He was to, in verse 3, make straight the paths for the Lord, the coming of the Lord. Now, it's interesting. At the time of the writing of the prophets, there was a custom. Before kings would travel, before sending out a king, they would send out workers, people to be sent out to level roads and make them passable. But even more so, in an extreme situation, a whole new road would be built. <laughs> Could you, wouldn't you love that? Rather than traveling I-5, right? Just build me a new highway so I can get where I'm going, right? They would, they would level out these roads, make them passable, or even build a new road. And the coming of Jesus, as we'll see in a little bit, is the coming of the Lord, the sovereign, the one who's supreme in authority. He is a king making a journey. And the messenger, John, was tasked with making his path straight, leveling it, making it a straight shot, removing any hindrances for the coming of this king. He was to prepare the people and equip them with all things necessary to embrace Jesus' arrival. But you probably already understand, maybe you're already thinking of this, that the road to being prepared was not a literal one, but it was a road to the human heart. Jesus was coming. Verse 4, let's pick up there. It says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The way in which John would prepare this road, make the people ready, equip them with everything that they needed was through proclaiming, heralding, with an authoritative declaration. He would speak with a strong voice, imploring the listeners to give the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, a fit reception and to secure his blessing. He would implore the people to create that reception without delay. The people were called to a baptism of repentance. A baptism of repentance. Repentance means a reversal or a change of mind or heart. This call to baptism was John's way of preparing the people for the coming of Jesus. The way in which the road to the human heart was made ready was what? It was the addressing of sin. That's what repentance speaks of. It's the turning away from sin. This baptism was symbolic of a person's reversal or change of mind towards sin. It was to prepare, right? That's what it said. Prepare them to receive the forgiveness or the pardon or the deliverance from sin that Jesus would offer and accomplish. And this is where we come to our next gospel facet. 
The go- one of the gospel facets is that of addressing sin. Now, there have been over the years many reasons that preachers, evangelists, teachers turn on your TV, you can see them, pick out a book in the Christian bookstore, you can read them. There's been many reasons over the years given to believe in Jesus or to follow Jesus or to accept Jesus. Pick your term. Some offer prosperity or wealth. Others offer health. Some offer a better life, a better marriage, more peace, or we hear this quite often, the plan that God has for your life. And not to be too much of a naysayer, while some of their, these may be true byproducts of salvation, they may come after the fact. They are not the primary issue to be addressed or sought. The matter that separates us from God is sin. It must be recognized and addressed. And so I would ask you this morning, I don't know where you are at with the Lord. I'm assuming many of you are believers. What was your motive to come to Jesus? Was the issue of sin addressed? Or was it, I grew up in a Christian home. This is what I've always done. Or, man, I really wanted my marriage to be better. Or I just wanted peace. My life was chaotic, and I wanted peace. Again, those things could be byproducts of salvation, but not guaranteed, but they could be. But again, the primary issue is the addressing of sin. And the good news is that Jesus has come to address that sin. Amen? That is good news. Verse 5, continuing on, it says, So in response to this heralding, this proclaiming, Of John, the messenger, it says all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river, confessing their sin. In response to John's preaching, the region of Judea and the city of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River to be baptized by him. Now stop and imagine the scene. I mean, I get the picture, I don't know about you, but I get the picture that there are these throngs of people leaving the countryside from wherever they live, leaving the city of Jerusalem where the temple was, where people would typically meet with God to go out to the Jordan to meet with this prophet, this man proclaiming this message. But they're going out there and they're confessing their sins. They're being baptized They're confessing and knowledge, agreeing that they're sinners. I mean, it's almost like you get the picture like they're going up to John and they just, they start with their laundry list of sins. There's something going on in their hearts. Now, Jewish history tells us that up to this point, you know, baptism or the idea of ceremonial cleansing wasn't a new thing. You can see in the law that there are ceremonial cleansings. And in fact, history tells us that at the temple there were these what are called uh, mikvahs. They're ceremonial pools where people would come and wash themselves. And they're coming out to John to be cleansed. Um, And there seems to be a preparation of the heart, people confessing and seeking forgiveness. And John lifts his voice, as we see one of his last purposes here is to point to one greater than himself. He wasn't drawing attention to himself, but he was pointing to one greater than himself. Verse 6, now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, he proclaimed, he heralded, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) We see an interesting thing here in verse 6. John, like other prophets, wore animal hair and a leather belt. He had a diet of locusts and honey. But these people going out in response to his preaching, we see John... He had a high view of Jesus. He viewed Jesus as mightier. That's the term he uses there. It means more powerful or more valiant. 
one who exhibited many excellencies, one so glorious that John saw himself unfit to even stoop or bend down or to bow his head to untie or touch the shoelaces of Jesus. Another gospel facet here we see, and that is a high view of Jesus. A great example from John here. In the gospel, we don't bring Jesus down to our level and make him our servant as some do. But we would always have a high view of our Lord. In his grace, he offers himself to us and he draws near to us. He comes near to us. He invites himself to us in fellowship, but there should always be a reverence and a fear, understanding of who Jesus is. But here we see the contrast, another contrast, where John exalts Jesus and lowers himself, right? There in verse 8, he says, I have baptized with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Where John baptized people with the waters of the Jordan, Jesus would submerse and cleanse sinners with the Holy Spirit. One commentator said, John could only baptize with water, which was an outward or symbolic washing, but the one coming after him would cleanse and renew hearts by the Holy Spirit. This is what made the work of Jesus completely different from the work of John. John sets himself apart from Jesus. He exalts Jesus. Another gospel facet here we see alluded to is the work of the Holy Spirit. This cannot be overlooked or ignored when it comes to the gospel and the work of salvation that God accomplishes in the life and the heart of a person. The Holy Spirit is there. He's involved. He is the one that regenerates. He brings new life to the dead sinner. When a person is baptized or submersed in the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit, but also his continuing work in the life of the believer, the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals Jesus to us. As we read the scriptures, as we hear the word preached, we understand who Jesus is. He is the agent that transforms and conforms us into the image of Jesus in the work of sanctification. When God saves somebody, he doesn't just leave them in their current state. He changes them in the inner person, making them more like Christ. And God brings about this work by his Holy Spirit. And that is good news, amen? Another gospel facet, before we leave this text, um, Another gospel facet that we don't want to leave too quickly and we want to see is that of the deity of Jesus Christ. Again, John had a high view of Jesus. He exalted him. One more observation that must be made. John the lesser is preparing people for the coming of the greater, right? Jesus Christ. Mark, the writer of this gospel, you saw at the beginning of the text, quoted two Old Testament passages right? When referring to, or Mark quoted two Old Testament passages, when referring to John the Baptist as the one who would prepare prepare the way of the Lord's coming. But it's interesting that he changes the original pronouns. He seems to interpret, Mark seems to interpret the original passages for us to help us give us an understanding of who John was, but more importantly, of who Jesus is. So let's look at our two quoted prophetic passages from their original text. First, we'll go to Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Notice, he says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Mark quotes the passage in Malachi in a way that portrays God the Father speaking to God the Son. But in Malachi, did you notice, God the speaker makes the Lord and the messenger of the covenant one with himself. It says, I will send before me 
adding, the Lord shall come so that the Lord must be one with me. That is, he must be God before whom John was sent. Are you tracking with me? As the divinity of the Son and his oneness with the Father are thus proved in this connection, so the distinctness of personality is proved by I send and he shall come as distinguished from one another is what Jameson Fawcett Brown wrote. And then, even more powerfully, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, this is the other quote that Mark makes. Again, he changes it a little bit. He says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for who? For our God. Again, where Mark quotes Isaiah and says, make his path straight, speaking of Jesus, Isaiah says that the voice would be preparing the way of who? The Lord, Yahweh, the one whom we've been studying about in Exodus. And he would say, making a highway for who? For our God. This can't be overlooked or missed, friends. If the one sent to be the Christ or Messiah to save, redeem, justify, and uphold this new covenant were merely a human, you and I would be lost. But Jesus, the Son of God, is divine and therefore able to accomplish this great salvation. And that, that, friends, is good news. So as John points to Jesus the greater, the one sent by the Father, so now we'll hear the voice from heaven to confirm the same. So let's look at verses 9 through 13, the voice from heaven. First, we see that Jesus is baptized. He comes. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, where he was raised and lived under Joseph, his adopted father, and Mary, his mother. And it says he was baptized by John in the Jordan. In the days that John was in the wilderness, Jesus traveled from his home and was also baptized in the river. Now, just reading Mark, so kind of put yourself in the shoes of the original reader, just reading Mark, we're not told why Jesus was baptized. But there may be one clue if we just use simple, good Bible study habits. Let's look at the context and make at least one observation. In our previous verses, we see that many were coming to John to be baptized, right? From Judea, from Jerusalem. And what, was it, what accompanied the baptism with those people? Repentance, confession of sin, right? They were responding to John's preaching in repentance and confession of sin. But here, do we find that in Jesus' baptism? No, we don't find that, do, that, do we? This is one point of understanding that we can take away from this. Jesus did not confess sin because there was no sin to confess. He was sinless. This is another gospel facet, the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. If Jesus had sinned, then he would be like us and therefore could not offer any hope of salvation. He had to be sinless. The sinlessness of Jesus is, a, is foundational to the Christian faith. Consider what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, Paul writing to the Corinthians, so it applied to them, but it, it can apply to us today too as believers. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Jesus the Son, to be sin who knew no sin. He knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That great exchange where Jesus bore our sin, becoming sin for us, even though he knew no sin, and in return in faith in Christ, we receive his righteousness. Now, it is worth mentioning that both Matthew and Luke, as other gospel writers, mentioned that John was at first reluctant to baptize Jesus. He pushed back, recognizing we've already seen the high view that John had of Jesus. He pushed back on it, but Jesus urged him. 
In Matthew 3, 15, but Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to what? To fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. At the command of Jesus and this understanding of what was going on, John consented to baptize Jesus. All that Jesus did to fulfill, all he did was to fulfill and complete and perfect righteousness. Another commentator said, if Jesus were to provide righteousness for sinners, which he did, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5, he must identify with sinners. Not become one, but identify with them. It was therefore in the will of God for him to be baptized by John to be identified with sinners. In another way, he identified with us in Romans chapter 5. Again, kind of link, putting this link, the sinlessness of Jesus and, and um, the righteousness that he accomplished through his death and resurrection that, are, that is given or imputed to us. In Romans chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, we see this. For It says, for if Adam, if because of Adam's trespass, death reigned through Adam... We read that in Scripture that as soon as Adam took of the fruit and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, death entered the world as God promised. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as Adam's trespass led to condemnation for all men, because all sin, as we read that Romans passage earlier, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And because Jesus was sinless, he can offer to those who believe his righteousness and justification. And this justification and righteousness is what makes fellowship with the holy God possible. And that is what, say it with me, that is good news. But as Jesus is baptized in a righteous act, we see next in verse 10, the heavens divide. And when he came up out of the water, immediately, straight away, all at once, almost like it's simultaneously, he, Jesus, saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. As Jesus is baptized, he beheld the sky being torn open or severed or split or divided. And it says the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus like a dove. These two events, again, in contrast to the crowds that were being baptized by John, right? Person after person, potentially hundreds, maybe thousands of people coming out to the Jordan to be baptized did once ever as one went down and came out of the water did the heavens open up did the spirit fall it's not recorded but here Jesus these two events in contrast to the crowds that were being baptized by John again this sets Jesus apart and shows that he was unique what an amazing scene we can only imagine at this point, I'm looking forward to heaven. I'm hoping there's instant replay in heaven. I'm hope that, I hope that's not out of place to say. When we're in heaven, I'm hoping God can show us the flood or just different things that we read about in Scripture. But what an amazing scene is Jesus is baptized in a righteous act, identifying himself with those who were also being baptized it's as if heaven opens up to approve this act and also the Holy Spirit falls on Jesus, anointing him for his messianic mission and to empower him to impart the same Holy Spirit to those who were to believe on him. Isn't that what we, was we read in verse 8? John baptized with water, but Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then in a third unique event at this baptism, we hear the voice from on high, the voice from heaven. Verse 11, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So in addition to the heavens opening, the spirit falling, this voice addresses Jesus directly from heaven. 
heaven, the abode of God. It's almost like it's coming directly from God's throne. Again, this distinct from all those that were being baptized. God the Father speaking to the Son, calling him his dear and esteemed Son, his beloved with whom he was well pleased. To call Jesus his Son speaks of the kinship between the Father and the Son. God was audibly declaring his pleasure over his sinless and obedient Son. Which brings us to our next gospel facet, and that is the Trinity. Did you see it there? The Trinity at work. The gospel is a Trinitarian accomplishment and fulfillment. All three members of the Godhead present here. We cannot leave here without stopping to recognize the Trinity present. The Father speaking from heaven. The Son being baptized, lowered, and raised out of the water. And the Spirit descending from heaven upon the Son. You know, Isaiah wrote something similar in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit in prophecy towards Jesus, his coming. In Isaiah 42, 1, it's on the screen there. It says, behold, this is God speaking, God the Father, behold my servant, speaking of Jesus the Son, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it, to what we heard the Father say at Jesus' baptism. I have put my spirit upon him. There it is, that Trinitarian view. The Father, Son, and Spirit are active and able to accomplish all that is told and offer in the gospel. And that indeed is what? Good news. But interesting, we go from this height of heights type of event to the Spirit, verse 12, immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Again, after this miraculous event identifying Jesus as the Son of God, it says the Spirit. Again, the Trinitarian work here, the Spirit drives or ejects or expels, banishes him out into the wilderness, a desolate or lonely or solitary place, pushes Jesus out into the wilderness. And we see that he was out there 40 days and it focuses in that while he was there, he was being tempted or enticed by Satan. To give a picture, too, he, uh, Mark the writer adds that he was with wild animals, but also that the angels were ministering to him. While the other gospels give details of the ways the enemy tested Jesus, again, we want to think of hey, I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm reading this. I don't have Matthew and Mark and John, or Matthew, Luke, and John to help me understand this passage. What am I to gain from this? It seems enough for Mark to show that the enemy did not defeat Jesus. In a sense, the first victory over the enemy is what Jesus shows all throughout his ministry. If you read through the book of Mark so often, you will find that Jesus is confronting and defeating and casting out demons. All through his ministry, by driving out demons, healing the sick, and most of all, by rescuing prisoners of the enemy through the preaching of the good news. Again, <laughs> So much here. Another gospel facet is that we see Jesus has victory over the devil. He has victory over the devil. You know, Satan is referred to many things in Scripture like a liar, a deceiver, a tempter, an accuser of the brethren. He loves to stand here and accuse you and me before the Father. He loves to point out our sin. He loves to condemn us. And these titles are true of him. We know and believe in one who is greater and will ultimately have the final victory in the last day. 
You know, prior to faith in Christ, Scripture tells us that each one of us are children of the devil, led astray by him, deceived by him, blinded by him through sin, through temptation and giving over to that temptation. But through faith in Christ, the one who didn't give in to it, and the gospel message, the devil no longer has jurisdiction over us. And that is what? Good news. And now the final voice in our text as we move to our last couple verses here. The voice of the Son of God arrives in verses 14 and 15. So John has prepared the way. Jesus has been baptized. Heaven has, has approved and acknowledged and identified Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. It says in verse 14, Now after John was arrested by Herod, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. The voice that was so passionately crying out in the wilderness is now silent, speaking of John and gave way to the Son of God. John had fulfilled his purpose. He had prepared the people for the coming of the Lord, the coming of Jesus, and now steps aside. And Jesus came, it says, proclaiming, heralding, preaching this gospel of God. This phrase is different than what we saw at the beginning of our text, but really refers to the same. Verse 1 said that it was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Here it's identified as the gospel of God. The gospel, all the matters that pertain to it are of God. We have already seen the Trinitarian work in the gospel. The gospel is his creation, and it's his accomplishing. God is the author of the gospel Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we see his preaching. What is he proclaiming? We see the Son's offer, the Son's invitation. It says in verse 15, in saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Here, like John, like the Father from heaven, Jesus lifts up his voice. He opens his mouth and we see another gospel facet that we'll pause and take notice of, and that is that the gospel is an audible message. It's an audible message. The gospel is shared. It's spoken. It's preached. It's heralded. It's sung, and it's read. It's communicated with words. Faith, Romans says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. I wasn't sure to do this, and I may ruin a coffee cup for you, but you've heard that saying, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Right? The gospel is words. It's a message. It's a declaration. It's a preaching. It's a declaring of who Jesus is and all that he came to do and fulfilled and here we see Jesus makes two declarations and then closes with two commands. The first declaration, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled or it's been made full. We've already seen the prophetic nature of the gospel, but here Jesus affirms this saying that the time or the timing of his coming was just as it was intended to be. Galatians 4.4 alludes to this fact as well. It says, but when the fullness of time, similar phrase, right? Fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. This coming of Jesus, this heralding of the gospel, the timing was perfect. God in, planned it and fulfilled it. But we see back in verse 15, we see the second declaration. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Kingdom speaks of realm or royalty or authority or a sovereign dominion. When we studied through the parables over the summer, we saw a little bit more about what the kingdom of God is. But Jesus says here, that kingdom, that reign, that realm is at hand. It was near, it had approached 
The kingdom of God, again, referring to God's sovereign activity of ruling over his creation, God in his sovereignty and his authority had intervened in his creation through Jesus coming and declaring this gospel message. Jesus as God's representative and agent was coming with a message from the king. This message was the gospel which spoke of Jesus as the way to be accepted into that kingdom. Which brings us to the commands of Jesus here. He says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is near. Command number one, repent. And we've seen this mentioned already, but it's interesting that Mark the writer uses a little bit different of a word. Repentance with the view of forgiveness of sins is what we had already seen, but here... Jesus proclaims the same message, but this word for repentance is a little bit different. It speaks of a change of mind, which we've talked about, but Jesus seems to take it a little bit deeper. The word repent here is defined by Strong's Dictionary as heartily amending with abhorrence of one's sins. Heartily amending with abhorrence, heartily of one's sins. Meaning, it's not only to view sin with the mind and identify, yep, that's, God says that sin, that is sin. That's part of it. That's where it starts. But it goes from the mind to the heart. It's a heart change of how we view our sin. It's viewing sin with, abhor- with abhorrence. Where we have a high view of Jesus, as we talked about, we are to have a low view of sin And then command number two is to believe. Here Jesus calls the hearers to believe or to have faith. We use that word faith. To entrust or to have confidence in the gospel. Jesus was calling the people to put all of their confidence in the gospel message. You could think of a a picture or analogy. Just like a skydiver has full confidence in their parachute right? We can only assume they do. They jump out of the plane. I was on a plane yesterday flying home and just looking out the window across America that was clear, so it was cool you could see. I mean, it's just thinking about, would I really do that? Would I really jump out of this plane? But just like the parachute, the, you know, the jumper has confidence in their parachute, so too the call is to believe or entrust oneself to Jesus Christ as revealed in the gospel. And as Jesus heralded the gospel of God, he was calling people to amend their hearts towards sin and to put or entrust themselves to Jesus as described in that gospel message. And so we'll close with this one more gospel facet. You look at the gospel message and it is a timeless message. It's a timeless message It's amazing to me that what Mark wrote some 2,000 years ago is just as relevant and hopefully powerful today. The same God who prophetically and sovereignly brought about the coming of John the Baptist and his son Jesus is the same God who is offering entrance into his kingdom today, working by his Holy Spirit as he did then, so he does now. The same multifaceted message that declares Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, having suffered a substitutionary death on the cross to secure eternal salvation for all who would turn from their sin and enter God's kingdom through faith in Him. As it was then, so it is today. And that, my friends, you could probably say it with me. That is good news. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we stand or sit <laughs> or kneel. We are in amazement of who you are and what you were able to accomplish through the gospel message. This message that offers such hope, such surety 
that was fulfilled and demonstrated in Scripture and throughout the centuries since then in such powerful ways, softening the hardest of heart, breaking down the, the hardest of pride in your grace, in your mercy, in your love to draw a people to yourself who were undeserving, who were by children, by nature, children of wrath, who were dead in trespasses and sins, those you have made alive by your spirit and drawn us into fellowship with you. We thank you for that gospel, Lord, that good news, that good message. We pray that this message would continue to go throughout the world. We pray that that message would be heard this week at Johnny and Friends. We pray that that message would go forth in Uganda with Dustin and Westcott. We pray as Greg prepares to go out that he would take this good news, this good message to Asia. And wherever we're at, Lord, in our day-to-day -day lives, we pray we would carry this message not only to encourage and comfort our own hearts as it was intended to the Roman Christians, but also to call others to faith and repentance as it did to those unbelieving Romans in the day that Mark wrote it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.